three, two. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to um, the Apprentice Program uh, for Thursday today. And uh, very excited today because we're going into, you don't have to listen to me talk today. So that's probably one of the most exciting things about today. I'm not talking much. Uh, so anyways, we've got the inspection module that we're going to go through today. Uh, everything you need to know about inspections and that, and that whole process so that you guys can understand what the, what the inspection process is about. And as you know, nowadays, uh, with most transactions that we're involved with, most sellers are all doing pre-sale inspections because they want to get the information out to the buyers prior to them writing an offer. So they're well informed uh, when they do write the offer. So we've got Marlin and uh, Hanley from HomeGuard with us today, who's our rep. And as you guys know, HomeGuard's our preferred vendor uh, when it comes to inspections. And we got Jimmy Stephenson with us today, who will be our keynote speaker today. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been with uh, HomeGuard now for, I think it's well over 20 years. So um, they've always done a great job for us. Um, I, I would tell you, I think they're the premier inspection company, uh, at least in this area. So um, I'm very, very fortunate to have them uh, running this training for you guys this morning. And ask them all the questions you want. And I'm going to turn it over to... Uh, to Marlin, so go ahead. Good morning, everybody. So term, uh, Home Guard is you make one call and you're gonna get to order your termite, your property, your roof inspection, your natural hazard and your home warranty. And the best part about that is the more you order, the more discounts that you get. And you're only having to talk about escrow information one time. Our reports are easy to read. We break them up in section one, section two, further inspections. And we have colored pictures in all our reports. So it's great for you to show your clients so that they can see everything that's happening. We don't charge for further inspections when only an ins inspector is needed. And at the end of the inspection, our inspector does an iPad summary for you and your clients so that if you do have any questions, they're gonna be able to answer it right there for you. You don't have to wait and get in touch with the uh, with the inspector. Now, let's say the next day you get your reports and you still have questions, call the office, ask for Curtis, our general manager, and he will be able to answer all the questions for you and your clients. Um, we al allow repair works. We have a concierge service um, that's free that when we do order the repairs, you can bill it to escrow. And every day they're gonna keep you updated exactly what's going on with the repairs. We have ENO, Worksman Comp, Liability in every division of Home Guard. And we have Saturday inspections, no char extra charge for that. And the best part is when you order, when you get the 8.30 or the 10.30 time slot, you are going to get your reports on the same day. And let me see, what else, Bill? What else is important? Me. If you ever have a problem, you call me. I'm going to take care of it for you. Okay, I, I'm done. Any questions? Okay, thanks, Marlene. That was the that was the commercial portion of this this training. Now we're going to get into it uh, and talk a little bit about the the termite inspection uh, and also some of the home inspection as well. So, um, you know, just to give you guys a, a background, um, Bill said he's been working with us for over twenty years now. But I met Bill, I think, sixteen years ago, and I know he was with us for a little bit before that. So. I think he's been probably closer to 25 years, 30 years. Uh, HomeGuard opened in 1988 and, and uh, Bill's been with us for a long time. Uh, he knows my dad, my dad started HomeGuard. Uh, I'm actually a third generation termite inspector. Um, my grandfather owned an inspection company in the 60s. Uh, my father branched off from my grandfather's company um, as father's sons uh, sometimes do. Uh, I graduated college twice to never work for the family business. Ta-da, here I am. But um, uh, Bill's been with us for a long time, and uh, we appreciate the business that we guys that we get from Legacy. Um, so we are going to talk about the termite inspection, um, and we have a PowerPoint slide here that Judy's going to help me kind of uh, cycle through. Uh, I'm going to integrate some of the home inspection training into this termite inspection PowerPoint. So as I'm talking about some of the termite inspections, I'll also weave in some information about the home inspection. If you guys have questions. Uh, generally, the chat is the easiest way. You can kind of pop those questions into the chat. Uh, Judy will help me out, and, and if there's a good question or if she wants to pause, you guys can ask your questions anytime. I'm getting the double thumbs up, so I think we're, we're doing good there. So 
uh, throw those questions in the chat. She'll interrupt me, um, but we're just going to kind of work through the slide here and, and talk about termite inspections, home inspections, what we're looking for as inspectors, um, what you guys should be looking for, how to read the reports. Ultimately, what we're trying to do in this training is give everybody a better understanding of how to read and understand the reports so that you guys can better uh, translate that information uh, to your clients. Uh, the more business that you guys get from the clients, the more business that we get in return from you guys. So uh, we're kind of working this relationship here. So right here on this slide, you guys can see this is our training agenda. Uh, we're gonna talk about these different uh, topics here, uh, termite inspectors and their requirement to be licensed, uh, what to expect from a termite inspection, how to read the report, the different type of inspections. Termite inspections, there's a couple different types of inspections that you will order depending on what your clients have. So what you represent will determine what different types of inspections you guys are gonna order. Uh, the different findings that we have in our inspections, uh, either termite or home, uh, some of the terms that we use, uh, you guys can get familiar with those terms. And then from a, a termite standpoint, what a certification is and when uh, a real estate agent might want or need a certification. So we can go ahead to the next slide. So this is what the termite report looks like. An interesting fact with the termite inspection that separates it from all of the inspectors. You guys take a listing and you order a termite inspection, a home inspection, a roof inspection, uh, a chimney, a pool inspection. One of the interesting things is that the termite inspection uh, will always look like this, no matter what the company is that you choose. And there are a lot of great companies. HomeGuard, obviously, a family business. I, I think it's one of the greatest. We, nice endorsement from Bill, but you guys have a lot of options. Talk to other agents. Who, but no matter what company you guys end up choosing, the termite report looks like this. And part of the reason for that is there's a governing body for the termite uh, industry. It's the Structural Pest Control Board. It's very similar to CAR. You guys, uh, uh, association, California Association of Realtors, we have an association, it's the Structural Pest Control Board. My grandfather was actually the president of the Structural Pest Control Board in the, the late 80s, early 90s. Because there's a governing body, there is there is an organization that dictates how the reports are put together, how, how they look. And so no matter what termite company you choose, this format is the format. And, and for anybody who's done any amount of real estate inspections, you guys will notice this form looks very familiar. We're gonna kind of go over this form. I see Marlene wants to unmute herself. She's trying, everybody look at her, this is funny. No, okay. So. So this is, this is the, uh, the termite report and it will look like this. Now, the difference between this and the home inspection, a home inspection report can look however the owner or operator wants it to look like. Um, there is no governing body for home inspections. Uh, Sherry, I could hire you right now and you could go out at three o'clock today and do a home inspection for me. Wouldn't be very prudent for either of us, but it also wouldn't be illegal. You could go out and do that because there's no governing body, there's no license requirement for a home inspector. Because of that, the home inspection varies. And you guys have all seen the different home inspections that you get, the different ways that they're laid out. It, it gets a little bit confusing because there is no governing body. For the termite, governing body is the Structural Pest Control Board. Every single termite report will, will have this page. So we're gonna talk about this report and kind of go line by line because everything on this is, is important. Uh, none of this is boilerplate, so we, we kind of wanna talk about it uh, line by line. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Judy. This report for any of, uh, any, I know this is kind of a, um, an apprentice program. So for any new uh, realtor in the group here, I've called this a termite report now, I don't know, 10 times already. In your guys' contracts, a lot of times it's referred to as a pest report. But the actual name of this report is a wood destroying pests and organisms inspection report. That being said, if you guys haven't done a deal, don't call another agent and never ask for the wood destroying pest and organisms inspection report because they're gonna know right away that you're brand new. Call it a termite report, call it a pest report, but we're gonna talk about exactly what we look for. We look for wood destroying pests. Those are the termites, the beetles, some types of ants. And we also look for wood destroying organisms. And the wood destroying organism is fungus or water damage, dry rot. Uh, those terms are all synonymous in, in the industry, um, but we'll talk about the slight nuances between those. Uh, but we look for the wood destroying pests and organisms. And so that's what it's, it's listed as here, wood destroying pests and organisms. We call it a termite report on our end. A lot of real estate agents call it a pest report, but let's, we'll, we'll get into it exactly what we talk about. Next slide. The address, the date of the inspection and the total number of pages. 
don't take for granted that those that that information is always right because sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes we we invert some numbers when we're typing them in, and then you go to turn and it gets right before your route ready to close, and somebody raises a red flag and says, "Hey, wait a minute, this termite report says 2623 anywhere street, but isn't the property actually 2624?" Read this. Read the information. Make sure that the address is right. We don't want to uh, miss any information there. The date of the inspection is important for, for a couple different reasons. The state of California deems that conditions change about every four months. So on average, the reports, for the most part, are good for four months. Doesn't mean that if I go out as an inspector and I don't identify something that I should have, and a year later, two years later, you can prove that I should have called that out, the termite company is responsible, even if it's past the four months. Um, but what you want to do is like if, if you're, you have a, a prospective buyer and they're looking at a property and another agent sends you a copy of a termite report and let's say it's this report right here from February of 2019. Yeah, that was that report was good in February of 2019, but we've had a lot of different conditions. A lot of different, California goes through the different seasons. Those conditions are likely to change. So pay attention to the date and then also the number of pages as well. So if you get a report from another agent and pages one, two, four, seven, and eight are there, but pages three, five, six are gone, what was on pages three, five, and six? Why isn't it included? So the number of pages is important as well to take a look so that if you get another copy of the report. An interesting thing about a termite report that separates it from a home inspection report or any other report that you get, another interesting thing is that these reports are public record. The termite report can be accessed by anybody, anywhere. All they have to do is go to the Structural Pest Control Board's website um, and type in the address. And within 10 days, you can have a copy of that report. And a lot of times it's faster now with email, it used to be mail. But now if you type in an address within a couple days, they email you uh, a copy of that termite inspection report. You don't have to be in the industry. You don't have to be a, a licensed inspector or a real estate agent. If the kid at 7-Eleven down the street wants a copy of this termite inspection report, he can get it. The home inspection, the pool inspection, the chimney inspection, all of those go to whoever paid for the inspection, but not the termite report. So if you guys uh, take a listing and you have an inspection done, any buyer that comes through that inspection can take a look. And, and we'll talk about it, but we post tags uh, with the date of the inspection. Those, those uh, are kept at the state's uh, website for two years. So if you get to a property and you see one of our inspection tags and it has a date within two years, you can get a copy of that report. Home Guard keeps our reports for about four years. So if you're ever looking at one of those tags and it's a Home Guard tag and it was done maybe three years ago or four years ago, give us a call because we probably have that report still. Go ahead, next slide, Judy, thank you. Um, this is the, the owner information, the, the, the uh, property information and then escrow. Home Guard, Marlon mentioned it, Home Guard, you can bill your reports to escrow, you can bill the repair work to escrow as well. We need to have that information. So if you take a listing and you have the escrow information, give it to us, we'll put it in the report here. But we wanna make sure that the, the uh, who the inspections were ordered by is correct, and then the property owner. And if you have that information, great, you can give it to us, we'll put it in this, uh, this box here. If for whatever reason they change, uh, maybe the, the property owner changes and we're, you, you would have to let us know because again, if you're, going, you're getting ready to close and information has changed, that might cause a red flag somewhere down the road. So we wanna make sure that this information is correct. Obviously, when you guys are calling in and ordering your inspections, our customer service and, and pretty much any inspection company's customer service is gonna do this for you. Home Guard, you can also order your inspections online. And so what we'll like to do is confirm that. So you guys input the information and sometimes we, we do it and we do it so fast, we'll call you and we'll, we'll go through this and confirm that the information is correct. Next slide. So now we're going to talk about one of those uh, uh, bullet points on what we were talking about were the different types of inspections on a termite report. When you guys order an inspection, uh, it's a single family house, uh, no detached structures. It, it's very simple, but almost always will be a complete inspection, a complete report. Next slide, I think has a, a quick definition. So you guys can read this here. I'll read it for you. A complete report is an inspection of the entire structure and all attached or abutted structures. This type of report is commonly used when inspecting detached homes. So if there's a house, anything on the house and anything attached to the home will be included and that's included on a complete report. But sometimes there are things at the property that we don't want inspected or there are things that we want inspected but we want to put on a separate report. 
we would have to do what's called a limited report. Judy, if you can go to the next slide. A limited report is used when a specific portion or portions of the structure have been requested to be inspected or excluded. So if there's a house and there's an attached deck to that home and you don't want that deck inspected, a lot of times decks are, are built, I have a deck at my house, it's built six inches off of the ground. I didn't really build a deck, I built a terrarium. If you guys know what a terrarium is, moisture comes up out of the ground, sits on the top, goes back into the soil, everything stays nice and humid. That's great for plant life, that's great for moisture conditions, but that is not great for a deck. And that deck will be, my deck is built to rot. I mean, that is what it's designed to do, it's gonna rot out. If I don't want that deck included on my inspection report because I know it's damaged, I, maybe I'm gonna tell the, I'm gonna tell buyer, here's an inspection on my house, here's everything. We know the deck is bad. We're gonna tear the deck out. We didn't even include it on this report. Because it's attached and we're not gonna include it, that report becomes a limited report. And common examples of this type of inspection would be condominiums, townhomes, or we're uh, requested to exclude attached structures like a deck or patio cover. A condo is always going to be limited because they're always attached. And when we go out and do the inspection, my inspection is for the entire structure. So if I was doing a complete report on a condo, I'd have to do the interior and exterior of all of the units that are attached. And you guys don't represent that, nobody's selling that. So uh, we would do a limited report on a condo. Sometimes it's limited to the interior only. Sometimes it's limited to um, the interior and exclusive use areas on the exterior, maybe your own patio but it's always going to be limited. What you guys represent is somewhere in those condo CC&Rs. Uh, Bill remembers when CC&Rs were, you know, like five pages. Now it's five binders full of information. Somewhere in that five binders full of information is what you guys are representing. In there, it will let you know. You represent from the paint in. You represent the sheetrock in. So we will inspect what you guys want us to inspect, but just know that that will be a limited report. Next inspection, perfect, uh, is a supplemental report. A supplemental report, we'll read it and then we'll kind of discuss it. A supplemental report is used when additional damage is found during the process of repairs or after a further inspection area has been opened to allow for an inspection. It can also be used uh, to make changes to an existing report. It's similar to an addendum in your contract. A couple examples of a supplemental report. Going off of the first sentence there, a supplemental report. If I go out to a property and very simply, there's a little bit of damage on the siding, wood siding on the exterior of a home, water damage. It looks simple enough. I charge $400 to take that siding off and put new siding on. But during the process of that repair, we take that siding off and now we find termites or now we find additional damage to the wall framing inside of that. We can't just fix that. We have to write a supplemental report. We have to identify any damage or infestation before we can do any sort of repair on a termite report. Uh, so we would have to issue a supplemental report and that supplemental, like an addendum in the contract, it gets added to the report listing what it is that we found. Uh, another a supplemental report, and this is very common in the real estate transaction, is a further inspection item. Uh, a garage full of storage is my favorite. Uh, it, it's on every single, uh, not every single, most home, it is our number one further inspection item is a garage full of storage. Uh, Marlon and I laugh at the real estate term. We're gonna talk about some termite terms, but here are some real estate terms that I love reading on a flyer, light and bright. Light and bright translates to, uh, am I about to get a question? Oh no, light and bright, uh, you know, like it refers to, oh, the house is so open, there's no clutter. Yeah, I know where that clutter is. It's in 15 boxes inside of the garage. You as a real estate agent came in and said, hey, we need to make this place look a little bit better. Why don't you take all your junk, put it in a box, we'll put it in the garage, we're gonna do an open house, everything's gonna look great. Open houses are a little bit different now, obviously because of COVID. Cozy is another, we all know what cozy translates to, small. But you put it on a flyer, cozy cottage, yeah, it's a 600 square foot cottage downtown, right? So th those are some, if I go to a property and that garage is full of storage, I can't do my inspection in that garage. I have to issue a further inspection. Uh, and that further inspection, when we go out to that property later, once the storage has been removed, maybe there was a locked bedroom or a locked attic, once we go back, we put our additional findings in a supplemental report. And even if we don't have any additional findings, we still issue a supplemental report stating so. So anytime we go out and do an inspection, we have to issue a report. Anytime we 
give any sort of professional opinion, it goes into a report and that would be a supplemental report. And then the last type of report that we have is a reinspection report. So in the state of California, termite inspections and home inspection, here's the third main difference. Because there's no license for a home inspection, no work can be performed off of a home inspection report. If I go out and I perform a home inspection, I find 10 things wrong with your house. I issue those 10 things in a report and I tell you to seek the appropriate trade. If I go out and do a termite inspection and I find 10 things wrong with your house, I'm gonna give you a bid to repair those 10 items and we can do that work. It's because we're licensed by the Structural Pest Control Board and we have a general contractor's license. So we can do those repairs. Doesn't mean that we have to do those repairs. Uh, Barry, if your brother is a contractor and he can do the repairs for less than HomeGuard can, no problem. I still have to go out there though and make sure that all of the damage has been removed. And when I go out to make sure that all the damage has been removed, that's a reinspection report. We can read it and then talk about it. Reinspection is performed when persons or firms other than the original termite company perform the repair work recommended on the original, limited, or supplemental reports. There's always an additional charge for reinspections of work performed by others. So that garage full of storage, if you get all that storage taken out, I'll come back out for free. I don't charge you to come back out. Most termite companies won't charge you to. I would recommend that you would choose a company that doesn't charge you to go out for further inspection items. If there was a locked bedroom or a locked attic or sub area, maybe there's a dresser over the sub area access, have the dresser moved, we'll come back out, we don't charge for that. But in that case, Barry, where your brother came out and did the work, I do charge to go back out to make sure that all the damage has been removed. And here's the law. I can charge as much as my original inspection to go out and do a reinspection. So if I charge 350 for a termite inspection, I could charge 350. We don't. Home Guard charges 195 for a reinspection. Um, but there will always be a charge with a reinspection. There'll always be a charge to have me go back out and make sure that your contractor, whoever you had, do the repairs. When I do a reinspection, I'm not looking for the quality of work. I don't, I don't care what it looks like. And sometimes, I'll tell you, I've done thousands of inspections where the repair work does not look the way that I would have done it. But if the damage is removed, I will, I will state that in my report that the work has been completed by others, no infestation or infection is in the visible and accessible areas. So that's what a reinspection report is. We can go on to the next slide. General description, one story, single family wood frame residence with brick and stucco wood exterior. Seems very simple, something that you would just glance over. Don't glance over that. Here's a little anecdote. I may or may not have, I don't know, you guys can decide. I may have inspected the wrong house one time. And I'll give you an example of how that would, might have happened. Uh, Missions Common Way and Missions Common Court. I don't know who in Fremont decided that they should have the same name, that's fine. But then to put the same number on the two buildings seems a little bit weird. And one of them was for sale and had a for sale sign. Uh, and the other one I assumed wasn't for sale. So in my general uh, hasty ways, I pulled up the house with the for sale sign, had the same number. It seemed like it was Mission Commons way, it ended up being Mission Common Court. Knocked on the door, nobody was there, allegedly. This is all just allegedly remembered. And uh, called the office, agent said, uh, back door is open, go ahead, go in, do the inspection. So uh, back door wasn't open, but the side garage door was. So I open the side garage door, I walk in, I do my inspection, I issue my report. Agent calls me next day and says, hey, Jimmy, I uh, got the report, thank you. The general description's wrong though. It says a two-story uh, single family. This is a one-story, remember? And I said, no. It's a two-story, take a look at item uh, 1B, the shelf in the master bathroom is damaged. That was upstairs. No, it's only one story. Here was a case where I didn't necessarily do an inspection. I may have done a little breaking and entering, but that if, if you guys don't read these reports, that might be something that would have slipped through the cracks. And then it gets down to when it's supposed to close and a, a, an underwriter notices those things and it causes a big problem. Fortunately, the agent caught it early, um, allegedly again, remember? Uh, and so we were able to fix that. So read the general description. If it doesn't match the house, you may have the wrong house, you may have the wrong report. What you want to make sure is that general description matches the general description of the home. Uh, the inspection tag posted in the garage. Oh, one back. Yeah. The inspection tag posted in the garage. Garage, uh, kitchen sink, sub area, attic. Those are the kind of the four main places that we post our tags. So when you guys are doing those, you'll notice those little three by five white cards or uh, some companies have, have different colored cards. But you'll notice on there, if that, again, if that inspection was done within the last two years, 
you guys can go ahead and, and get that inspection done, uh, get an inspection report from us. So now, we talked about at the top what this report was called, Wood Destroying Pests and Organisms Inspection Report. Obviously, nobody called it that. They call it a termite report. Here are basically the five findings that I have in any termite report. Subterranean termites, dry wood termites, fungus or dry rot, kind of synonymous, other findings and further inspections. So here's where the two, like a termite inspection and a home inspection differ on what it is that we look at. Both inspectors do roughly the same thing. They're both gonna get to your property. They're gonna knock, they're gonna introduce themselves. They're gonna walk around the outside. They're both gonna look for similar things on the outside, wood damage, um, Termite inspector is looking for the things that destroy wood. Termites destroy wood by eating the wood. Fungus or dry rot destroys wood by destroying the cell walls within the wood. Uh, the wood will get uh, compromised, it gets soft, um, the wood will crumble, and it loses its structural stability. Both a termite inspector and a home inspector are going to look for that. A home inspector uh, looks at the systems and components of the home. So. Uh, a home inspector on the outside is going to be looking at the roof system. They're going to identify what type of roofing system it is. They're going to look at the chimney to make sure there are no cracks. Uh, they're going to look on the walkways to make sure that none of the walkways are heaved or cracked or broken. Um, so they're looking at the, the general condition of the home and the structure and components of the home. Whereas the termite inspector is looking specifically for the things that destroy wood. And here we have those things that destroy wood. Subterranean termites, dry wood termites, fungus and dry rot. So we're gonna talk about those individually. Uh, go ahead and next slide, subterranean termites. If we broke the word subterranean down, uh, sub is below, terranean, the earth. So subterranean termites live in the earth. Those are the ground dwelling termites. Uh, we'll just read it. Uh, these types of termites are the ground dwelling species. Subterranean termites access the wood via mud shelter tubes. The most common treatment of this type of termite is a chemical treatment of the infested soil. So you guys will notice your inspector is walking around the perimeter of the home and they're looking down at the foundation. Uh, what they're looking for is evidence of subterranean termites. Now the termites actually live in the ground. It's rare that we see subterranean termites. It's rare that we see dry wood termites for that matter. But subterranean termites live in the ground. What they do is they crawl up through these little migratory tubes. Uh, they keep these mud tubes at about the size of a pen or a pencil. Um, and what it does is it, it protects and it gives them some sort of uh, shelter, um, but it also keeps a certain amount of humidity. The reason they live in the ground, it, they get that nice humidity, they get the, the, the perfect weather conditions for them to live. So as they're uh, migrating, what they do is they take microscopic pieces of wood and bring it back to their colony. They don't eat it on site. They, they harvest the wood and they bring it back to their colony. Um, we'll go ahead to the next slide. Here are this is, this is what I look for as a term, termite inspector when I'm crawling underneath the homes. So you guys can see in the top left uh, box there, those are migratory tubes coming down off of a girder. So I'm crawling underneath the house and I'm looking up a, a post and a girder. That's a floor support there. And what has happened is the termites have worked up kind of the creases of that wood support and now are inside of that wood. And what they're doing is now building tubes back down to the earth. They're taking that piece of wood back down through those migratory tubes and then going into their colony underneath the ground. Um, you guys can see in that top middle picture, those are subterranean termites. There, there's a cast system within the termites. Termites are a lot like ants. Um, and so when we treat for termites, uh, the previous slide mentioned that the most common way that we treat for termites is a um, soil treatment. So what we do is we take chemical and we inject it into the soil. I don't have, if the sub, subterranean termite colony has you know, they, their colonies can be 500,000 termites, up to a million termites. If they have a million termites in their colony, I don't have to kill all million termites with my soil treatment. There's one termite that I have to kill. That's the queen. She runs the colony, she runs the house. It's like my house. There's one boss, it's not me, it's the queen. Subterranean termites live by the same kind of motto. The queen is the main reproductive. She's the only one that reproduces. So she's there, she's kind of in the center of the colony you have reproductives. So those are the ones that mate with the queen all day. Those ones don't go out and harvest the food. They stay local to the queen. Then you have a group of soldiers that protect the queen and the reproductives. And then you have the final caste, which is the workers. And they go out and they harvest that wood and they bring it back to the colony where they can feed the colony. They feed the soldiers who are protecting the termites. Uh, termites number one enemy is an ant. 
And so I inspected homes and people know that. If you don't, now you do. Uh, but people will say, well, don't worry, Jimmy, I don't have any termites. I've got ants, but I don't have termites. All I have to do is follow the trail of ants because I know where the ants are going. The ants are going to the termite colony because the ants eat the baby termites. You guys have seen ants walking, they got those little white things on their back and you think, oh, that's cute. They're carrying their babies or they're, ca they're carrying food to their, they're not carrying babies, but they are carrying babies. They're carrying the termite babies that they've robbed from the termite colony and then they're taking it back to their ant colony. So uh, what we have to do when we do a treatment is I just have to get enough chemical in there to kill the queen. Here's the beauty of the chemical that we use. And most companies use this. Um, it is a transfer chemical. So I am doing my inspection. And let's say I come across this top left picture here of those subterranean termite tubes along the foundation wall up into the girder. All I have to do is inject chemical right into that spot. Because I know that termites are accessing the wood through that point, And I know that termites are going back down into the colony. Where are they going? Back to the queen. So that chemical, termites are like ants. They rub on each other, they groom each other. What they're doing is they're passing a pheromone trail it's to let all the other termite workers know, hey guys, I found food, I know where it's at, just follow this trail. Well, when they groom, they're transferring that chemical that we put into the soil. The termites are blind, they can't see the chemical. They can't really taste it, smell it, or feel it. So they crawl through it and they don't know that it gets on them. And over time, it will start to destroy the termite. Well, in that time, they they have enough ability to transfer that chemical all the way back to the queen. So that's what we're doing when we're doing a chemical treatment. If I only found subterranean termites in that one spot there on the top left, I would do a spot treatment where I crawl into the sub area and I inject a chemical right into that area right there. But that top right picture or that bottom right picture, that's a lot of subterranean termite activity. I might, in that case, termites are a little bit more than in just that one spot. And what I would do in that case is a full perimeter treatment of the home. And that's where you see our guys, they drill these series of holes every 12 to 16 inches around the property. And they take this long three foot rod and they inject that rod into the soil. And then they start pumping the chemical into the soil. That way, no matter where the termites are coming up, they're gonna come in contact with that chemical. And again, that transfer process works and they take that chemical, take it right back to the queen, wipe the queen out, wipe the colony out. So that's what we're doing when we're doing a subterranean termite. The only time really that I actually see live subterranean termites is a thing called cellulose debris. If you're new to the industry, it's a term that you might not know, but you will get very familiar with because almost, every, Bill's laughing, almost every property that we inspect has cellulose debris. And what that is, is wood scraps in the sub area. So if the house has ever been remodeled or work has been done, some of the contractors are a little bit lazy. They'll, they'll cut some wood and they let that wood fall in the sub area. And instead of scooping it out and taking it, they just leave it in the sub area. No big deal, right? Wrong. That's like feeding the chickens for termites. They're going to come up, they're going to feed on that piece of wood. And when they're done with that piece of wood, they move from that piece of wood to your home and start eating your home. So uh, if I'm in a sub area and I plop a piece of wood over, I might see live termites crawling through that piece of wood there. That might be the only time I see that kind of middle picture, top middle, that bottom middle picture is uh, termite queen. You can see how much bigger and fatter she is. I've, uh, I've seen one queen. I've done a, about a thousand inspections, 2000 inspections. I've seen maybe one queen. Um, we were doing some work on subsiding, popped the siding open, and she fell out and looked like it was a caterpillar compared to these little termites are like ants, subterranean termites. They're, they're a little bit smaller than ants. So to see this big caterpillar looking thing pop out of there is kind of neat. Um, a mature queen can lay 10,000 eggs a day. Doesn't mean that all will survive, but uh, that's all that she does. She sits there and pops termites out all day. Uh, Technology has gotten amazing, not that any of you ever would, but if you ever wanted to, you can go on YouTube and watch videos. It's crazy uh, how they get these little microscopic cameras into these subterranean termite colonies and you just kind of watch the whole thing. Again, I say that and as soon as I say that, I go, nobody's going to do that. Why do you even mention that? But in case you ever got bored or something, fall down that rabbit hole of YouTube. So if we go to the next slide. Hey, Jimmy, we had one question come in from Shelly. We, we have two, oh. but this one on this slide. On the picture on the left, where are the tubes touching the ground? The picture on the left, the top left picture or the bottom left picture? Well, I'll talk about both. So the top left picture, those tubes were, were kind of in the process here. This picture was taken as they're working those tubes down. So I know that that's a very active uh, infestation because they can build a tube from the wood. Let's say it's 24 inches from the wood to the soil. They can build that tube within a day. So I'm looking at this picture here, top left picture. Those tubes are on the wood, but not to the ground yet. 
termites are in that. If I knock that piece of wood over, termites are going to fall out of that piece of wood because they're actively building those migratory tubes. Uh, there's one the, the, up against the white wall. Um, there's one tube that kind of goes out of frame. That too is probably where the termites originally accessed that girder. So they all climb up through the one tube and now they're building all their different migratory tubes back down to the soil. The bottom left picture is the opposite. They're working their way up to the wood. That is a very, very mature colony there. I've only seen that a few times. Um, but anytime we see something like that, we like to take pictures. These are all home guard pictures. Um, but that's something where these, th that colony kind of looks like coral in, in the ocean. What they're doing is they're just building these tubes up from the ground, um, trying to act, trying to find wood. And they just kind of spread out until they find a piece of wood. And then they, they all focus to that one area and get that wood. So Thank hopefully you. that answered that question. Yeah, we'll uh, hold on. Thank you so much. We'll hold the questions till the rest of the end. Go ahead. Okay. So yeah, we'll go uh, next slide. Drywood termites. So drywood termites. Now remember, termite guys are very simple people. I, yeah. Uh, termite guys are very simple people. So when we call drywood termite, we know where that termite lives. If I was in a live class, I'd, I'd raise your hand if you can tell me where drywood termites live. And everybody just kind of, they, they do this thing where they, they know the answer, but they're kind of, it can't be that. Drywood termites live in dry wood. The dry wood that constructs your home is where a dry wood termite lives. So they don't return to the soil. They don't, they don't eat the, the wood and then return back to the soil. They eat the wood where they live. Um, and we can read termite, dry wood termites build their colonies inside of the wood that they are infesting. Unlike subterranean termites, dry wood do not have to make contact with the soil to get moisture. There are several recognized methods of treatment for drywood termites, such as fumigation and localized chemical treatments. If I go out to a property and I only find drywood termites in one area, maybe two, uh, maybe if it's open framing like in a garage and they're in a couple different areas, if I can limit the infestation, if I know where they go, then I can do a local treatment. And that's where we go in the same chemical that we inject into the ground, we drill a series of holes into the wood and we inject that chemical into the wood. But if I get to a property and I can't determine where those termites are at, I have evidence of drywood termites. And we'll talk in the next slide, we'll talk about what the evidence of the termites look like. But I have evidence of drywood termites in a bunch of different locations. I know that those termites are spread throughout the home. I can't do a localized treatment, it won't work. It won't, it won't get back to the queen. And there may even potentially be two different queens, two different colonies. So what we have to do in that case is a fumigation. And for any new agent in the room, the fumigation is where uh, we put the, tent on the house, the house goes camping for the weekend. We pump chemical gas, the same liquid gas that we inject into the wood. There's a, there's a gas form that we uh, pump into the home. We steal the house off, we pump that chemical gas in there and we, we fumigate the home. I will tell you guys that a fumigation is not an easy process. It's invasive. Uh, we, we have to go into the home. We have to open up drawers and cabinets. Um, and it's not always an easy process. And it's much, much longer than a, a local treatment I can do in three or four hours. A fumigation will take three days. So you guys wanna make sure, especially the new agents, make sure that the treatment options that you have work for you. Uh, and you also wanna make sure that there are some companies that don't, we, we opened up an office uh, in San Diego and Riverside three years ago and two years ago. And in Southern California, they see one dry wood termite pellet they call to have the house fumigated. And it's, it's recognized, the state of California says that that's a, an appropriate method of treatment, but it's not always the best method of treatment. A local treatment sometimes works better. If you have people living in the home they, and they don't wanna move out for three or four days, choose a company that offers you local treatments. Um, you, you would, plus the cost. A uh, local treatment is about a third, sometimes you know half, but a third of the cost of a fumigation. So you wanna make sure that you're choosing what type of treatment works best for you and your clients. Now, obviously, if it's bef you know, after the sellers have moved out, before the buyers have moved in, fumigation is easy. If nobody has to move out of the house, we can do that treatment piece of cake. Um, but dry wood, uh, fumigation will only work for the dry wood termites. We get that call a lot. Some of the homes, about 70% of the homes that we inspect have dry wood termites. About 35% of the homes that we inspect have subterranean termites. Some of the homes, about 20% of the homes have both. And we'll get a call where they only paid for the fumigation. And then they get, well, you know, we saw a subterranean termite six months later or whatever. 
So fumigation will only work for drywood termites. It does not permeate, it goes through all of the wood in the home. And there's enough pressure inside of the house to, for that gas to work through the wood, but it doesn't permeate the soil. It doesn't go through the, the soil to get to the ground dwelling termites, the subterranean termites. So on some of those, about 20% of the homes, you might have two different types of treatments. One might be a fumigation, one might be a local treatment for subs. So in the report, when you guys are reading the report, and we'll talk about that, it will tell you what the recommendation is. We'll go to the next slide. This is what we look for. And sometimes I see more dry wood termites than I will see subterranean termites. Um, but the evidence that we're looking for is kind of this um, middle picture, top middle picture, uh, top right picture, bottom right picture. Those are the termite pellets. And that's what I look for as a termite inspector. Dry wood termites leave pellets. And anybody in this room knows what the pellets are. It's termite poop. I have two college degrees and I identify termite poop all day. That's what I do. But that's what it is that we look for. We know that they're in the wood. If I see a migratory tube, I know that's where the termites access the wood for the subterranean termites, but I don't know where the colony is at. It's not always important that I know where the colony is at because that's transfer chemical. But if I see dry wood termite pellets, I know exactly where those termites are at. They're right there in the wood because that's where they live. That's where they eat, that's where they sleep, and that's where they poop. And so what will happen is the termite that drew the short stick that day will eat to the surface of the wood, create a tiny hole in, in the surface on your sheetrock or whatever it is, uh, and then sit there and kick out those pellets. It means that their colony is too full. If you look at um, that top right picture, uh, if those termites are working through that piece of wood, you can see how many pellets are on that, that face of that wood. It's hard for them to migrate through there. So what they'll do is they'll kick those pellets out and they create these tiny little holes. And then that bottom left picture, you guys can get a good uh, understanding of the size of a, a termite. Termites, in that picture, you see them next to a penny. You also see pellets and you see the termites themselves. And what you'll notice about those types of termites is that they have wings. Both subterranean termites and dry wood termites get wings, but they're not born with wings. No termite is ever born with wings. Uh, and, and one of the things that you would notice about looking at that, how big those wings are. Termites, when they grow wings, it is their sign that it's a reproductive. Those are the ones mating with the queen. It's the sign that that is time to, to leave their colony. Their colony is too big, too full. They grow these wings overnight and it's their sign. Oh my gosh, I have these wings, what do I do? I leave the colony and I go try to start a new colony somewhere. That's called swarming season. We are getting into swarming season right now. As the weather starts to shift from hot, hot to some days warm, some days rainy, like right now I'm in San Jose, it's still completely overcast. This is the perfect time that termites will start to swarm. They only swarm twice a year, spring and in the fall, but they grow wings that are too big for their body. They don't know how to fly. They get caught in the, the you know, flutter, they flutter in the wind. Um, and you guys, you literally could pick the termite out of the sky when they're, when they're swarming because they don't know how to fly. Now, in California, it's illegal to kill termites when they're swarming. I'm kidding. I can't even say that with a straight face. Don't kill termites when they're swarming, though, because to me, that's, that's my business, right? Uh, you guys see bugs flying around. I don't see bugs. You know what I see swarming season? Little dollar signs flying around. They, what they're doing, though, is they're leaving their colony landing, what they will do is they will drop their wings instantly. And now you, if a male and a female land together, you have a new king and a new queen and they start that reproductive process. And they can reproduce pretty quickly. If she's laying 10,000 eggs a day, their colonies can grow from two to 50,000 within a, you know, a year or two. That top left picture, you can see the, the termite with the big mandibles, the big jaws, that's a soldier. And I know he's a soldier. He, he, they grow those big jaws and it's to protect themselves from the ants or crickets or whatever trying to eat them. So, um, but that's, that's what I'm looking for, those, those dry wood termite pellets. Uh, I, my now wife was, uh, I was set up on a date and I go to her house and it's the first day that I'm there and I, I walk in and on her fireplace mantle, just dry wood termite pellets everywhere. And I'm, our date's in February. Uh, and I, I, every ounce of me said, don't say anything, Jimmy. Don't say anything, Jimmy. I'm a third generation termite inspector. It's in my blood. I had to say something. So I said, oh, you guys have some, you know, do you know who owns this place? Because you guys should have a, a treatment done. So what are you talking about? I said, you have dry wood termites here. She said, no, that, that was just glitter from the Christmas wreath we had there. So you guys haven't cleaned since December or in February. That wreath has been gone. What? She said, yeah, we, we clean every week. What happens is you can wipe those pellets away 
and they'll keep kicking the termite pellets out. You can clean them, they'll kick them out, you can clean them. So we see them on windowsills all the time, around door frames and door jams, because that door will slam, more pellets will fall out. That door will slam, more pellets will fall out. So we look for those dry wood termite pellets, and, and you'll see termite inspectors are always looking on windowsills, we're always looking at the bottom of door jams, side garage doors, and then up in the rafters, you can see that bottom middle picture there. Termite pellets, they, when they're swarming, they don't have a flight direction, they can't, they can't really aim where they're going, so they hit a house and generally they land on a roof. And what they're looking for is wood somewhere. Generally, they find wood at the closest wood, that's gonna be a rafter on the outside of the home. And so that's why we see them. They get into the attic and then they'll work down the rafter tails. And that's why those termite inspectors are walking, they're touching the end of the rafter tails because in that bottom right picture, or bottom middle picture, you can see that those uh, rafters have all been infested by drywood termites. So we can go to the next slide, Judy. Fungus or dry rot. Couple slides here. Um, we're we're kind of work through the slides quickly. This is, you guys have these slides, so it'd be important on the next one for you guys to read at some other time. But fungus and dry rot are synonymous in our industry. They're not technically the same though. Fungus is a living growth on the wood uh, that destroys the cell wall of the wood and it takes various forms. There's kind of a, the initial mycelia form, which is like a light surface fungus, a little like it's like chalk on a piece of wood. That type of surface fungus can be scraped off. But if it starts to grow into some what we call sporias, the little mushrooms grow on the wood, that's fungus. And that active fungus growth will destroy the wood. And the way that it gets there is wood gets wet and dries out and gets wet and dries out. And over time, that wood will start to rot. The reason we call it dry rot is because that's what most contractors are gonna call it. So if you guys are giving these reports to somebody, they, they know the term is dry rot. But dry rot, it, it's dry now, it was wet. The wood is dry now, but the rot, the problem, the, different, the real technical difference is that fungus is active and dry rot's kind of in this dormant state. So they're not, they're not the same, but in a contract, if you see fungus or you see dry rot, there are some companies that will, like ours, our reports say fungus slash dry rot. Other companies might just say dry rot. Know that that's fungus. And some companies might say fungus, but in their reports, they say dry rot. They're the same thing in our report. We can go to the next slide. Here's kind of some examples. We don't need to go into these today. You guys will have these and kind of a, a, a good slide to have to understand. Um, there are some fungus that grows on live wood. There's some fungus that grows on dead wood. The fungus that we're concerned is obviously the dead wood. That's what a termite eats is dead wood. That's the reason that termites are so prevalent in this area is because, you know, I'm in San Jose. This whole South San Jose was all orchards at one point. A termite's main function in life is to take a dead piece of wood and return it to the earth. So they eat the wood, they break it down, and then they poop it out and that gets back to the earth. A termite doesn't know a dead tree branch from your house because technically they're made out of the same thing, right? They're both wood that's not living. There's nothing living. And a dry piece of wood that's from a branch has dried out completely. The wood two by fours and four by sixes that your home's built with go through a process of kiln drying. They're dried pieces of wood. So that's what a termite eats. Some of this other fungus grows on live wood. We wouldn't ever identify any of that, but it's a good slide to have for future reference. Uh, Judy, we can go to the next one. The other findings, other findings is things that aren't infestations or infections, but eventually will become infestations or infections. Um, and we call those, we're going to get into it about what a sectionalized report is, but we have a uh, different thing and most common, I think the next slide actually, let's check it out. Yeah, these are, these are uh, other findings for us. Things that you guys will look at and be like, well, why are you putting that in your report? There aren't termites there. There isn't any water damage there. But if you leave these items alone for long enough, termites or fungus will come. So a gutter that's clogged. A gutter isn't designed to hold water, designed to shed water, designed to get the water from your roof away from your house. Well, when you're holding water in a, in a gutter that's clogged, that water eventually is gonna find a, a leak. It's either gonna uh, corrode whatever is holding it, um, or something will crack or bend, water will get on wood, and eventually will rot that piece of wood out. And then that other picture is grout. A lot of times we find grout that's been chipped away, cracked, old. Um, that grout is a section two item. It's enough for us other finding. If you don't do anything with that, water is gonna eventually get in, permeate that wall, 
and get through there and get into the wall uh, studs and cause damage there. And a lot of times we see that. I know, looking at that picture right now, I know that there's damage behind that tile. I'm gonna pop the tile off, I'm gonna look, and there's gonna be damage there. Those would be other findings for us. And the last one is the further inspections, and we already talked about those. The further inspections would be like your garage full of storage. The further inspections, you know, no matter what type of inspection, and here we can kind of work in some home inspection stuff to this, no matter what type of inspection you guys order, termite inspection, home inspection, roof inspection, the one thing that I want to convey to you guys today, if you take away nothing else from this, other than the fact that I may or may not have inspected the wrong house one time, remember this, read your reports, read the reports. There isn't, there isn't anything boilerplate in this. There isn't anything that, that uh, isn't important. Even the date and the pages, no, read the reports. A lot of times, seasoned agents will look at the further inspection items and just bypass them. It's not a section one, it's nothing active or uh, nothing in fact, it's not a section two, there's no general maintenance that needs to be done, it's a further inspection, don't worry about it. I would argue that the further inspections are as important, if not more important than the section one. At least with the section one items, and we'll talk about those, but at least with the termites and the fungus, we know what we have. You're gonna read that report, you know what's there. With the further inspections, we have no idea. I could issue you a further inspection. I inspected a house one time, uh, East San Jose, I get to the inspection, I'm meeting the uh, buyer's agent there. I go to the, I diagram the front of the house, I look at the front, I go to walk down the side and there are two Rottweiler dogs that jump up on the gate. I don't know the dogs, they don't know me and it doesn't look like they wanna to get to know me. So I ask the agent if he knows the dogs or can control them. He says, no, I have. First item on my report is a further inspection of the backyard. I can't inspect the backyard. I have an idea, maybe we'll open the garage, let them into the garage, I'll go do the backyard. I open up the garage, it's full of storage. I have two items on my report right now. Backyard is inaccessible, garage is inaccessible, both further inspection items. Uh, I get inside of the home, the master bedroom is locked. Inside of the master bedroom was the attic and the sub area and the master bathroom, obviously. So most of my house looks really clean, but I have three major items on my report that are further inspection items. We're gonna talk about a certification. So remember that story so far, we'll circle back to it and talk about the fumigation, but. I mean, talk about the, the certification at the end there. But when you guys have a report that has a further inspection item, a termite report, we just talked about those, a home inspection report, further inspection items might be like a locked electrical panel. We want to take the dead front off of the electrical panel because there's a lot of important stuff behind it. We want to see if anything's scorched. We're looking, as a home inspector, and remember, we're looking at the systems and components of the house. One of the major components of a house or systems is the electrical system. So I wanna make sure that there's no scorching inside of that electrical panel. I wanna make sure that there isn't a thing called a double lug where two power sources that are supposed to have their own dedicated breaker, multiple power sources into one breaker. It's called a double lug and it's a dangerous electrical uh, issue that we would put in our reports. Uh, if I need to get into the sub area as a home inspector, I'm looking at the plumbing underneath the water areas, but I'm also looking at, I'm looking for cracks in the foundation. I wanna see if they're vertical cracks, horizontal cracks, I wanna see if they're, they're wide, I wanna see if anybody's marked them before. Those are all important systems and components that I need to get to. So if for whatever reason on an inspection report we are unable to get to those, call and order the further inspection right away. Now, Home Guard, our inspectors are gonna to talk to you at the end of the report. They, if anybody's ordered inspections, our guys go through their iPad and they're showing you, they'll tell you about the further inspections. The second they leave, I pick up the phone, call Home Guard and order the further inspection. Have us come back out the next day. Oh, take the lock off the electrical panel, open up the master bedroom so that we can get into those areas, so that we can perform those further inspection items. Because and you don't no, want, go ahead. And no charge. And no charge, obviously no charge for those further inspection items. So why wouldn't we get those done? Just for the peace of mind. And maybe there's nothing there and that's great. But I've inspected homes and won't get back, I'll kind of circle back to that one house that I wasn't able to get to the backyard, the garage or the sub area to talk about some of that stuff. So we'll go to the next slide, Judy. Garage full of storage. There's a perfect example of a further inspection item, a water stained sheetrock. Now underneath, that's probably a bathroom above it and something was leaking. Either a tub drain or a toilet drain was leaking. We need to know what's going on inside of there. Maybe it was a one-time leak. It hasn't leaked again. Uh, maybe it's an active leak and maybe there's damage there. So we need to open that area and look. The one caveat to the free further inspections would be this. If Home Guard has to do any work to open that area up, then we will charge for that. If we don't have to do any work, then we won't charge for that. 
Barry, I'm picking on you, uh, but in my previous anecdote, you had a brother who was a contractor. Let's assume you still do. If he can open that area, I'll come back out for free, right? But if I have to open that area up, that sheetrock on the ceiling, then we charge for that. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Keys to the diagram. Now we're talking about what they are. Section one, section two, and further inspection. Every single term I record, I think if we go to the next slide, Every single termite report has a diagram on, on there. This is where a home inspection and a termite inspection differ. A home inspection, we walk around, we check the systems and components, the plumbing, electrical, uh, roofing system, structure, heater, air conditioning, ventilation system, but we don't put a diagram. Home inspectors don't ever include a diagram. Both the termite and the home inspections at HomeGuard will include colored pictures, but only the termite report is required to have a diagram. And what that diagram serves as is a way that anybody can look at that diagram and know where the findings were at. It also helps to signify what each one of those findings is in terms of section one, section two, or further inspection. So we'll talk about what section one is. It's an actual infestation or infection. If I go out to a property and you have drywood termites, subterranean termites, fungus damage, rafter tails, those are all section one items. Those are all active infestation or infection. In this case, it's an infection, fungus infection. Home inspectors will call that uh, action items. So a home inspection, there isn't section one or section two because it, there's, there's no governing body that requires them to name them. We call them action items and non-action items. Action items would be the items that we deem are important and should be paid attention to. The non-action items would be simple fixes. Grout needs to be caulked. Uh, toilet needs to be reset. Those are non-action items. Action items in a, in a home inspection report might be a, uh, four foot vertical crack in a sub area, horizontal crack in a sub area. That is something that you wanna have somebody come out and take a look at right away. Um, so in a termite report, it's called section one. In a home inspection report, it would be an action item, but it is something that you guys need to pay attention to. Uh, section two would be, uh, oh, sorry. Yep, section two would be conditions that will eventually lead to an infestation or infection. Uh, in a home inspection report, a non-action item, if you leave it non, if you don't do anything with it for a long enough period of time, it's likely it'll eventually convert to an action item. If that toilet is loose and you don't ever reset it and it leaks and causes damage to the sub area wood members, that now is gonna be an action item. So section two in here, and we've talked again about the further inspections. One thing to note on a termite report is that the, the item number, section one at home guard all start with the number one. Section two, then all start with the number two. Further inspections then would start with the number three. That is going to differ. Um, there, the state doesn't require that you mention it one way or another. You guys have looked at other termite reports where it's 1A, 2B, 7A, uh, 7G, 11A. Other companies will go where the infestation or infection is at. So one is all subterranean termites, twos are all dry woods, five is all garage or patio, uh, 11 is all exterior. It's a little confusing, whereas for us, it's geared for a real estate transaction. Section one is important for you guys. So we're gonna put all of the section one with the number one, all of section two with the number two, all the further inspections then would start with the number three. Ready? These are the areas that are not inspected on any termite report. Uh, interior finished walls. I'm not Superman. I can't see inside of the wall. And I also can't open up, I can't do any destructive inspection at the time. My inspection is a visual inspection. I can maybe touch things to find out if they're solid or not, but I can't do any destructive work to a property. I can't cut anything open at the time of my inspection. I can't open up walls. So we're not gonna put that there. Uh, behind install cabinets, uh, just calling some of these other things. Um, attics, when the installation is above the catwalks or the framing. Uh, we've had inspectors fall through the attics before. So what we're trying to eliminate is that happening again. In the report, you guys will see on page three of 15 on this one, but most of the times page three for us, there's, a, there's a, an entire section there that says areas not inspected, please read. These would be areas that termite inspectors don't inspect. There is a, on the home inspection report, the same deal, areas not inspected. That isn't boilerplate though. That, and I, we highlight, we capitalize, we bold it, please read. If your home wasn't two stories, you would never see a note in there about us not being able to get to the second story wood members. If your house didn't have carpet, you wouldn't read in that part of the report that we were unable to pull the carpet and inspect underneath the carpet. So although it's, it's 
looks like it's boilerplate and it's not a part of the actual findings and recommendations in the report, we only put the areas that are on that actual property. Read that area because a lot of times you will get clients or customers that call us and say, hey, you didn't see the, the crack in the foundation in the master room or in the, the uh, great room. Well, we didn't see it because at the time of our inspection, there was carpet there and we don't pull the carpet back. Home inspectors don't, termite inspectors don't. That would be in that area is not inspected, please read. So we can go to the next slide. Guarantees and not guarantees. Now here's, there's a slight difference between a guarantee and a warranty. A guarantee says, I'm gonna kill all the termites, I guarantee they won't come back for three years. But I can't do that. I can't, a termite swarm and they don't have a flight path and I can't, there's nothing I can put on your home that's gonna stop a termite from getting in. It's kind of the beauty of our business. The termites have been around for billions of the years. Uh, in this area of termite company, it's because there's nothing really that we can do to stop termites. There's things that we can do to slow termites. Keep your house painted, keep your house well sealed. Uh, don't leave piles of wood outside of your home, firewood, because uh, all those things will attract termites to your home and eventually they'll get into your home. So technically what we do is a warranty. We call it a guarantee because it's easier that way, but we guarantee that if you have termites and you do a fumigation, we'll, we'll guarantee that property won't have termites for the next three years. Really what it is is warranty. If you do have termites, Within the next three years, call us up, we'll come back out and we'll treat that termite infestation for free. There, is, there are some companies that only do a two year guarantee. Make sure that the companies that you end up choosing offer a three year guarantee because like I said, termites swarm, they land together, they do reproduce quickly, but it does take a couple years. And so we might not even see a new, if I fumigated my house today and I took the tarp off today and termites landed on my house today, they start a new infestation, I probably wouldn't see that infestation for two years because they're well within the wall. They don't need to kick out any of their pellets. Uh, they can stay inside of the structure. I might not even see them for two years, maybe two years, six months, two years, eight months. I might start to see some of that. That's why we do that third year in there. So make sure that you're doing it for third year. What we don't guarantee, never would, oh, go back one, just one to is any work performed by others is the important one. So anytime you have a, a re-inspection done, I can go back out there and tell you that all the infestation or infection is gone. The damage has been removed. I clear your property, everything's good. But I'll never guarantee the work that was done. So the new buyers move in and six months later, the workmanship has failed. They're gonna call me, they always do. And I'm gonna say, listen, somebody else did the work. Oh, you put the, the, the certification on it. I certified that the property was free and clear of any infestation or infection, but I never guarantee anybody else's work. Can't, right? So we only guarantee the work that we do. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, this is a reinspection. We kind of talked about the reinspection. The important there are a couple of important things to know about a reinspection. So if you are going to have somebody else do the work, that work has to be done within four months of the original inspection. If you get an inspection done today, you can't call me in June of next year to come out and do a reinspection. It might have taken you eight months to do the work, but you can't call me eight months later and have me come out and do a reinspection. I have to do what's called an updated report first, and we charge a lot more for that. The reinspection has to be done within 120 days of the original inspection. Um, and the reinspection must be done within 10 days of request. So the old timers, my grandfather, used to get mad when other people did the work. He wasn't necessarily real estate based, he was more direct to consumer. So he, he got mad when he would go out and do the inspection, somebody else would do the work. Because that was a one time client for him. But I know Bill's gonna choose us to do work sometimes, he's gonna choose somebody else to do work sometimes we have a long standing relationship. I'm gonna get some work from Bill over the years. What my grandfather, company, what old time companies used to do is, oh, you need me to do a reinspection? I'll be out there next month. They used to push you out and they used to get people mad. Well, then the state said, wait a minute, wait a minute. If an agent calls and asks for a reinspection, you have to do it within 10 days. Now for us, you're gonna always get that inspection within 10 days, but um, just if, if you guys are calling and asking, technically we have up to 10 days to do that reinspection. Um, it's a visual inspection. Yeah, and then any guarantees would be anybody doing the work would have to get the guarantee from that. Next slide. Here's how the report is broken down. Here in the termite report, you have your section one items. All of our section one items go together. All of our section two items go together. All of our further inspection items go together. No matter what company you choose though, their items will give you a recommendation and a finding. The finding is, What's wrong? What did, they, what did they find? 
um, on a home inspection report, here's the action item, here's what's wrong. You have a vertical crack, uh, vertical crack in your uh, sub area, you need to have a concrete specialist come out. In the home inspection or the termite inspection report, you have fungus damage to the rafters, here's what needs to be done. We need to either replace the end of that rafter or we need to take the whole 12 foot rafter out and replace the rafter. And here's a picture. Now, HomeGuard includes some pictures in their report, not always. Uh, you're gonna get that from other companies. HomeGuard uh, does it because we also do it in our home inspection report. It's pretty standard in a home inspection report to have pictures. On a termite report, we're one of the few that does that. So you guys will see that. You guys will see the section one finding, the, the recommendation, how to repair that, and then a picture to give you guys some reference points. Go ahead, next slide. Authorization agreement. Now, I mentioned earlier that as a termite company, we're licensed and we also have a general contractor's license. So you guys can choose to have HomeGuard do the repair work. There's an authorization agreement. We don't need to go over it in detail. Uh, what's important is that you read the agreement and that you sign an initial of three different pages. Next slide. Initial at the bottom there, signature on the middle there. Oh, let's hold on this slide here real quick. We include prices for our reports. We know that right now, especially right now, return reports are being, a lot of times being used for negotiation purposes. We know that work isn't being done um, because you know sellers have a lot of power right now. Inventory is pretty low. Interest rates are incredibly low, so a lot of buyers. Uh, so there's going to be multiple offers on these homes. The house across the street from mine had original owner move out. Uh, hasn't been touched since 1960. In terrible shape. Looking at the, the real estate agent didn't care. He had 15 offers in the first weekend. Work isn't going to be done because the number one buyer is going to be like, give me the house. I want the house. I'll do the work later. What we don't want to do is focus on this section one dollar amount and use that as negotiation. A lot of times seasoned agents will do that. They open up, they go to the last page. What's my section one? Because that's what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to work off of. In this case, 7,200. Okay. That's what I'm going to negotiate. But there was also four further inspection items here. So on that house that I inspected that I wasn't able to get to the backyard, the uh, garage or the sub area. That particular home had a patio cover. Here's what happened on that house. Uh, I issue that, I write that report. I don't have any section one on the report. And when you don't have any section one, and we'll talk about this on the next page. When you don't have any section one on an original inspection, you must certify that property. And a certification says that there is no infestation or infection on that property. Here's the caveat, in the visible and in accessible areas. So on this home, I only had a few visible and accessible areas. It was the kitchen, the hallway, one of the bedrooms, but I had a whole bunch of inaccessible areas. The backyard had a patio cover that was attached to it, but didn't have any slope. It's actually kind of leaning back. So anytime it rained, water collected and drained down the back of the house, caused damage on the back side of the home. Um, the garage had termites in it. Get into the master bedroom, uh, get into the sub area, the, the master bathroom stall shower had leaked so bad that the, the floor was ready to cave in. So on this particular home, there was like 40 or $50,000 worth of section one that showed up in a further inspection item that wasn't in the original report. So don't just look at the section one items, look at the further inspections, make sure that you're not just gonna negotiate off of that section one deal. And sometimes, sometimes section ones have further inspections built into them. So if I'm at a property and I see wood siding that is bad. I know that there's damage inside of there, but I can't see inside of there. I'm not going to give a dollar amount just to fix the siding because I know that there's damage inside of there. So I'm going to give you a dollar amount to open that area up and look inside later. So that's why it's important to read the reports. You guys have a fiduciary responsibility to best represent your clients. You're as, as important as lawyers are in a contract. So if there ever was a problem, the first person your clients are going to go to is you. And they're going to say, Hey, why didn't you, why, I bought this house, we negotiated off the section one, and now I, I got this house, and my master bathroom floor is ready to cave in, I called the inspection company back out, this $50,000, what do I do? Well, now you, now you got yourself into a little bit of a pickle, and you could never stand in front of a judge and say, hey judge, I did everything that I could. Well, why didn't you read about further inspections? Oh, I didn't read the reports, what do you want me to do? No, read the reports, read and understand the reports, that's why we're talking about them today, because uh, they'll bet, better help you in the future. So we'll go to the next slide. Here are the different certifications. Um, you guys can, can kind of read and understand these, but if I go out to a property and there's no uh, termites or fungus in the accessible areas, I'm gonna give you a certification on the spot. It'll be included in my report. 
The other section uh, certification would be the middle one there is if you guys have a reinspection done. So if, if I go out and do the work or you guys go out and do the work uh, and I go out and certify it, that will then come in the reinspection report. I'll go back out and say the damage has been removed, others have performed the repairs, no uh, visible or accessible damage, here's a certification. There's a third type of certification that we use on occasion uh, for like condos really. If I go to a condo and it's got termites so bad that I have to call a fumigation, condos aren't gonna do that fumigation because condos work off of a kind of their a yes, no deal. Yes, we know you have termites. No, we're not gonna take care of them. Or yes, you have termites, we're gonna take care of them. But no, we're not gonna take care of them right now. So then what do you do if you have a lender that's requiring that work to get done? We can do a local treatment. We would just exclude the fumigation off of our certification. So we did all the other work. We just didn't do the fumigation. In lieu of that fumigation, we did a local treatment. We can work with you guys. That's where it's important to have a relationship with Marlin because she can help you. You guys can call her and say, hey, Marlin, I got some issues here. Termites on a condo, what do I do? And then she can help you out. So I'll go to, I think the last slide maybe. Yeah, so, so that kind of wraps up the, the termite inspection. What I want to talk about on, on the home inspection, the, the difference is the home inspection is like, I kind of liken it to, I have bad knees. I've had bad knees for a long time. I do that. I don't know if anybody heard it, but my knee just cracked as loud as I'm talking. But if I have knee issues and I want to get those knee issues fixed, I go see my general doctor first. I go to the hospital, I go to the doctor's office. I say, hey doc, my knee's bothering me again. What do we do? He says, okay, I'm going to sign you up for an MRI. I go get my MRI. I have a torn meniscus. My doctor then refers me out to an orthopedic surgeon to do my torn meniscus. That's what a home inspection is. We go out and we identify the problems to the systems and components of your home, and then we refer you out to the appropriate trades. There's one thing to re remember about a home inspection though is home guard's not gonna tell you which contractor to go find. I'm gonna tell you you need to see an electrician, but I'm not gonna tell you which electricity. So you guys need to, over time for the new agents in here, is you start to develop your teams. And in your teams, you're gonna have electricians and plumbers that you constantly go to for, for work. Because when you order a home inspection, the home inspection company cannot do the work. They can refer you out to the appropriate trades, but they can't do the work. Uh, the termite inspection companies can, and I will issue that report. Uh, the termite inspector is a lot like your dentist. I go to my dentist, he says, my tooth hurts. He looks in there, he says, you have a cavity. He's not gonna refer me out to another person because he's licensed, he's governed by the state. He, he has a license. He says, okay, I'm gonna fix it right here for you, which I love. We're working towards having home inspections be licensed because once they're licensed, we can start to do the work. And then it will make your life easier because it's one less phone call, one less job that you'll have to get booked with another company. Plus, it will lower dramatically the cost of the inspection. So we're working with, uh, with uh, CAR kind of lobbyists in the state to get that license process. Um, we have our own lobbyists. We've been pushing for a long time to get it licensed. We want to be able to do the work for you. We just can't at this time. So, uh, But that is kind of the main difference between a termite and a home is a termite inspection can do the work. Home inspections can't. Um, they're going to go out, spend about the same amount of time on the property. They both spend about an hour and a half out there looking at the different systems and components. Uh, they're going to both give you the findings and recommendations, um, but the home inspector will just refer you to trades, whereas the termite inspector will actually do the work. So, kind of wraps it up. I, I think, you know, Judy, we may have some questions in there. It looks like there might be a few. I don't we do know. We have a couple of questions in here, so uh, let's just kind of go through those. Yeah, we'll open it up. All right, we've got from Shelly. What is home policy on recertifying after a seller has done the work themselves? Recently had a homeowner want to do their own roof repair and they are not in the trade. What's your opinion on that topic? <clears throat> For me, I don't care who does the work. I don't care if it's a handyman, a licensed company, a homeowner. All I'm worried about is that the damage has been removed. They could leave, if, if there was water damage, uh, rafters, they could cut a hole out of the rafter, cut through the roof and cut a hole out of the rafter and take that damage out and leave a big hole in the roof. That's all that I'm concerned about. So for, for me, I would just recommend if you're, if you're not gonna have a licensed company, if a homeowner is going to do the work, that they're, they'd be ready to stand behind that work because if there was ever any issue with that, it's gotta go back to somebody. And in that case, it's gonna go back to the, to the owner. And that, when I do a reinspection, when I certify that property, again, I don't, I'm not looking at the workmanship. I'm not looking at how well it was done, the aesthetics of it. 
I've had bathroom floors that have been bad where they just cut the entire bathroom floor out so that they could get that certification from me right away. And then they'll go back and replace the wood later. So um, that's kind of tough for me to say. I, Bill might have a, a better response on having homeowners do the work themselves. But if, if they're capable of doing the repairs and they're willing to stand behind the repair, go for it. Yeah, my, my opinion too, uh, Jimmy, you've done a great job today. I, I love the detail. Um, my opinion is when you're, when you're doing work or your homeowner is going to do the work, don't close anything up until you get the reinspection done so that the inspector can see that everything has actually been removed. Because if you close it up, they really can't sign off on that. So just make sure that if you run into more work, like Jimmy was talking about earlier, with supplemental damage and you see it, then remove it. Then you call them out. And what you want to do is only have one reinspection. So get all the damage removed then have them come back out while when it's everything's removed so they can do that reinspect for you and then you close the stuff up because that's what that's what Jim's got to do he's got to sign off that all the damage has actually been removed another question in the chat bar from Shelly says are there wet wood termites that go into the soil or only dry wood uh, so there are wet wood termites they're called damp wood termites um, they don't go in the soil though they live in the wood uh, damp wood termites, if you guys, you know, most of, yeah, Marlin has them in Pacifica. If you guys are doing, most of the stuff you guys are doing is on the East Bay there. But if you guys cross over the peninsula, you're doing anywhere where there's a, a high moisture content in the air, the Pacifica, Daly City, San Francisco, South San Francisco, where there's a lot of fog or maybe, you know, Los Gatos Mountains uh, up into Santa Cruz, wherever there's a lot of, excuse me, wherever there's a lot of moisture in the air, you could get a third type of termite called a damp wood termite. They're very similar to termite, dry wood termites in that they live in the wood. For that, if we can stop the moisture, the, the termites will die off themselves. We don't even have to do a treatment. Uh, otherwise, we, we kind of treat those termites like we would a, a fumigation. And the important thing to do is try to eliminate the moisture source. But in the fog belt, Pacifica Daily City, South San Francisco, it's kind of hard to remove the fog. So uh, we have to treat those termites and we would treat them like we treat dry wood termites, either with a local treatment or with a fumigation. She asked, Shelley asks, how bad is fumigation for humans and pets? Deadly. <laughs> it's, it's really bad. Uh, it is 100% lethal. So we have to take extra precaution when we do those treatments. That's why we have to open those areas up. We're not opening up the cabinets because we want to see what type of plates you have. We're opening the cabinets because we don't want a pocket of air to get trapped in there. So that when you do open that, you in, in, now that wouldn't kill you. Uh, it might make you sick, but it wouldn't kill you. You would need exposure. You need, I think, make a number up here, but I think you need about five minutes of exposure to the chemical gas and it will kill you. And there was a case about four years ago, uh, a small, like a fourplex was being fumigated. Somebody broke into the fourplex while it was being fumigated and was in the property for about five minutes and got out. And uh, that was a commercial building. Anytime a, a fumigation is being done for a commercial building, it needs to have uh, like a guard or somebody watching the fumigation. Not necessarily a guard, just somebody making sure that tenants aren't trying to get in. In this case, the guy went around the back, but that guy was feeling sick. He came out, he knocked on the door of this RV. Uh, my grandfather used to do that once he retired, and then he just became a way he parked his RV in front of all these different fumigations, but um, told the guy, hey man, I'm not feeling well, can you call the cops? By the time the police got there, he was really sick. They asked him, how are you sick? What's going on? And he said, well, I'm, I'm broke into that uh, apartment complex or that fourplex. Um, so they rushed him to the hospital and died on the way to the hospital. So the fumigation is incredibly lethal and it will kill. So my grandfather has been in the business for 60 years now and his, his little motto or slogan is uh, pets, plants, and in-laws. It'll kill them all. So um, you want to make sure that everything living has been removed from the home. Anything that you ingest, anything that you put in your mouth would be medications, uh, food, all that stuff is going to be taken out of the house. Baby toys. And here's the thing with baby toys. I have a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old. But when they were babies, everything went into their mouth. Everything. Didn't matter if it was designed to go in their mouth or not. Everything went in their mouth. Because of that, a lot of times, like on little balls, they drill a small hole so that air, could, well, a pocket of air could get, some of that fumigation air could get inside of there. And that could be much more harmful to a small child than it would be me. So you want to make sure that you're taking out all your food, all your medication, uh, all of your pets have to come out of the house. It won't, like if you had a fish tank, 
it wouldn't get through the water. But the problem with that is a lot of times they have a little motor and a little pump that pumps oxygen into the water. What that's going to do is pull that chemical into the water and it's going to kill the fish too. If you have plants, uh, we've had people with bougainvillea and ivy on their homes, a lot of times that's going to die in a fumigation. And the good thing with ivy and, and you know, quick growth plants is they'll come back. But uh, what you want to do is, is pull the plants away from the home about a foot so that we can get those tarps down because it is, it is lethal. And that's why, again, you want to make sure that you're choosing when you, when you have the option, a local treatment, if it works for you and you can get a certification from it, take a local treatment because you, those are issues that you don't even have to worry about when you do a fumigation. That answers Sandra's question. Uh, so you open cabinets and drawers, do you remove all the contents from the shelves and drawers uh, when fumigating a home? So it we don't, like we don't. So it's, it's a gas. It doesn't stick to anything. You know, what we breathe, there's nothing that sticks to my hand right now. What we want to make sure though is that it doesn't get into areas where it could get trapped. I have a gun safe at my home. I have to open my gun safe if I'm doing a fumigation because the gas will get in there and it will stay inside of there until I open my gun safe later. And if I catch a big whiff of that gas, that could be harmful. So you bedding, dishes, none of that stuff has to be taken out of the house. Although I do know this is the first thing that happens after the fumigation is done. Everybody takes their dishes, they throw them in the dishwasher, they strip their bedding, they wash off. None of that has to happen. Um, but most people do it anyways. The only things that need to come out of your house are the things that you put into your mouth. Uh, food, you can get, because we have to, you know, cut the power off to the house or the gas off to the house. So, you know, a lot of times we'll take these, uh, there's these things called a nylo fume bag where you can put some of that stuff in and seal it and it has a strong enough seal that gas won't get into those. Um, but, you know, if you have fruit sitting out on a counter, an orange, the orange peel is porous. Gas could get into that orange manifest itself into that orange and then you eat the orange and you get that, that chemical in the So Also, uh, yeah. Wine. Wine. Yeah. Wine. Wine. Um, yeah, there, there are ways that you could store a wine bottle if you have to. There, I mean, we've inspected $25 million homes with wine cellars as big as my house. There are ways that you could store a wine. You want to make sure that you store it down so that the, the wine is touching the cork and not up because it, it stops the air from getting inside a little bit better. So, but it, I mean, if you have a small wine collection, take the wine collection out before you do the fumigation because, you know, I mean, if you, especially if, if you're collecting wine, you know, you're collecting it for a reason. You might have a bottle of, you know, 72 Ridge Montebello that you want to keep. If you do, call me, I'll come over and drink it with you. But, um, Karen asks, what can you do to protect your property from uh, when they are swarming? Nothing. Can't. I mean, you could stand out there with a fly swatter, I suppose, but um, there really isn't anything that you can do. Again, keeping your home well painted and well, well sealed. A lot of times I, I watch these spec homes get built in like three weeks. These, these construction, these toll house, our toll brothers build these homes in like three weeks. And what they do is they set all the rafters and then they come through and all those rafters have been pre-painted, pre-pined, pre-painted. And what they'll do is they'll just come and rip the ends of the rafter tails off to get a nice angle, but they never go back and paint the end of that rafter tail. And what happens is that rafter tail, now that's an easy spot for termites to get into. So what you want to do is uh, keep your house well painted, well, well sealed, pull any wood away from your home. I have a fire pit um, and I used to keep firewood right next to my house. I don't do that anymore. I have it elevated up off of the ground kind of in the back because subterranean termites are going to come and they're going to find that wood, they're going to eat it, and then they're going to find wood that's on my house somewhere. So um, really isn't anything that you can do to stop them from swarming. And that's why termites reinfest the same property. You can do a fumigation today and have a new infestation in a couple of years because the term termites have swarmed from someplace else and landed on your house uh, and started infestation. And a lot of times we find the infestations in the same areas because they just follow the wind currents. The right side of my house, I, I have a two-story home on but only on the right side. The left side is one story, the right side is two story. So on the left side of my house, no wind. I don't get any wind because the house blocks it. But on the right side, it's like downtown Chicago, the wind whips through there every day. That's where the termites, if, if they were swarming, they're gonna always swarm on the left side of my house and land there because that's where the wind current takes them. If they land, they hit the window or they hit the wall, that's where they're gonna infest. So I've inspected properties five years apart, the same house five years later and found termites in the same spot. And the homeowners didn't believe me because they're like, no, that's exactly where you found them last time. It's either the same infestation or that's old. I'm like, no, 
we kill them and they're active again because they've landed there and they've started a new colony. So nothing really that you can do to prevent them. Thank you. In the spirit of time, we're going to kind of run through these last questions. We have five minutes left. Alfreda asks, when, uh, when you tend to home, how long does the chemical last? Just until we take the tarp off. So we, we pump the gas in. The gas sits. So the first day, we seal it all off. Seal the house, put the tarps on, put the sandbags around the base, pump the chemical gas in. We pump it, we pump it, we pump it. Then we cut the gas, and that gas sits under pressure for two days. And then on the third day, we pull the tarp off open up the house, that gas uh, escapes into the atmosphere, and then we walk through the house with a meter and we make sure that there's no more, there's not a, a high level of the gas in the home. Once we give you, that gas is gone that day. So it doesn't stick to anything, there's no residual. The, the, the uh, chemical gas that we pump into the gas, the liquid gas that we pump into the ground, liquid chemical that we pump into the ground, that lasts for about three weeks. Um, it, it, it loses its efficacy over time, over those three weeks, but it's still, so, um, but it's, that's safe for, for people and pets because it's three feet below the surface. So your dogs aren't there, they're not playing in it. Um, but we, that lasts for about 21 days. It gives that time, it gives that chemical enough time to work itself through the colony to wipe it out. Um, but the gas, the fumigation is gone the day that we give you the keys back. Kelly asks, how do you test the sheetrock? How do we test the sheetrock? Um, I mean, what, you know, it's a visual inspection. So if I'm looking at the sheetrock and there's a stain on it, I might touch the stain to see if it's wet. Um, but there's there's no real way to test the sheetrock itself. I'll I'll look to see if I need to open that sheetrock to see if there's something going on behind it. A lot of times there'll be visual cues on the sheetrock itself to let me know. Uh, but most of the time it's just with my eyes or my my fingers. If I see a moisture source. Like, you know, if I'm, if I'm in the garage and I know the master bedroom's above me and I see a big water stain, I'll get my ladder and touch that sheetrock. Because if it's wet, I know I have an active leak and I need to get that open to see what's going on. Uh, but if it's dry, which most of the time it is, that means there was a leak there sometime. The nice thing with leaks is over time, they'll, they'll kind of stop themselves. Get calcium in the water, calcium buildup will, will stop the, the little hole. And so you, you might have had a leak at one point and then the leak stops because it kind of sealed itself. Doesn't mean that everything's great. We need to fix that because it'll leak again. Um, but yeah, I just, I kind of just touched the sheetrock if I need to. Clive asks, what are your thoughts on orange oil treatment? Great question. Um, we have it. We have orange oil. If you need it, there are special clients that you guys will have. That's the beauty of my job is I deal with your clients for about an hour and a half every day where you just have to deal with them until escrow closes and then potentially beyond. And sometimes there are clients that I, I can tell in an hour and a half that you guys don't want to be with them but you have to be. Those are the ones that want that orange oil. We have it. I don't believe it works. It works if you get enough of the chemical onto them. It is a contact chemical. It is not a transfer chemical. So if you <laughs> apply that chemical, it doesn't transfer. It kills the termite on the spot. The problem with that is I have to know exactly where the termites are. And if I don't, I have to do a huge treatment. So on a dry wood termite treatment where I see pellets on a windowsill, I can treat the header above that just that header. But if I'm doing an orange oil treatment, I have to treat that entire wall. And when you do a larger treatment, guess what goes up? The price of that treatment. So all of a sudden now, the local treatment, the orange oil treatment, the one that they think is safe, is the same or more than a fumigation would have been. And here's the problem is, we hear the ads for orange oil that it's a uh, chemical-free alternative to a fumigation. It's, uh, those are all, the, the, it is not chemical-free. But they never say that. That's just what we hear. They also never say that it's an alternative to a fumigation because it's not. A lot of times those orange oil companies will go out and they have to call it fumigation. Uh, the orange oil, uh, it, it is not uh, an alternative to a fumigation and it is a chemical. It's registered with the EPA. It has a warning label on it. Uh, I think Sunkist is the number one manufacturer of orange oil in, in the U.S. So they make their orange juice and then from the rind of the orange, they derive that chemical. But it's, it's not just like they're squeezing oranges on your house. It is a chemical. If you ingest that chemical, it, it is harmful. The nice thing is, is it smells great. I, I mean, it does smell like oranges. And you could be in the property while they're doing the treatment if you needed to be. But a local treatment only takes a few hours anyways. So um, there's been a lot of, I was part of a study at UC Davis um, where we, there were different testing done. Um, orange oil 
nowhere near as effective as Termidor or Premise, which is the chemical that we use. But we have it. So if you have those customers or clients, call us because we have orange oil that we can use. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Marlon. I'm handing it back over to Bill so we can round on time. Cool. Hey, you guys. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Great presentation today, Marlon. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, I think everybody learned a lot out of this today, including me. Um, I just thought it was a very good, detailed explanation, Jimmy. So thank you again, buddy. I really appreciate your yeah. uh, time. Uh, next Tuesday, we'll be doing lending, guys. Paul will be on there to teach how to pre-qualify a buyer and go through the lending process. So thank you all today for attending. Go A's. <laughs>